Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, and tuning into this webinar, which is uh, organized by the Media Freedom Rapid Response a Consortium of Organizations in Europe, including IPI and many of our partners. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, Central Europe in particular has emerged as a, a kind of regional flashpoint in the battle for the future of independent public service broadcasting. Uh, so in Slovenia, um, pressure uh, and editorial appointments to, to oversight bodies under the previous government um, and editorial decisions of new management uh, has caused a really quite tense standoff with editorial staff. Um, and as these internal disagreements and, and strikes continued, uh, the new government has brought forward legislative reforms to depoliticize radio television Slovenia. And on Sunday, uh, there's going to be a referendum challenge initiated by the opposition. Uh, so the quite gearing up, gearing up for that. And in the Czech Republic, meanwhile, country which has always been considered as a regional model for independent public service media, years of sustained pressure under the private government of Andrej Babish. Um, the new government likewise is edging closer to passing new legislation, which is aimed at limiting political interference and shoring up the broadcaster's institutional independence moving forward. So here we have two countries with a shared set of pressures uh, and similar initiatives by new governments to pass democratic reforms. So in this webinar, we're going to discuss the latest developments in both countries, explore the parallels uh, in the challenges they face, and assess both of the, the reform initiatives uh, and then we'll also zoom out to look at the regional perspective in Central Europe and beyond and discuss how the European Commission's draft Media Freedom Act could play a role here. Uh, so to do so, I'm joined by uh, three expert speakers. First is Ksenia Horvat, uh, journalist and broadcaster at Radio Television Slovenia, uh, Jan Bumba, a presenter at Czech National Radio, and Radka Becheva, head of member relations for Central and Eastern Europe, the European Broadcasting Union, EBU. Uh, I'm the moderator, Jamie Wiseman, the EU Advocacy Officer at the International Press Institute. So before we jump in, just a few words on the format. Uh, first of all, we'll take a deep dive into the two countries, Slovenia and the Czech Republic, um, looking back first at the, the pressure, and then we'll bring ourselves up to date, looking at the current reform initiatives. Uh, we'll then zoom out to the regional perspective, uh, and at the end, we'll open it up to questions for Q&A. Uh, but if you have questions as we move forward, you can type them in the chat uh, and I can read them out to, to whoever you've directed them to. Uh, so, yeah, with no further ado, uh, I want to turn first, Ksenia, to Slovenia. Um, given the, we're seeing the referendum on Sunday, the campaign is in full swing. Uh, so I think it would be first great to do a recap just to kind of bring us up to date um, about how we got to the position we are now um, you know, initiatives and, and uh, developments on, on, in the previous years, which have created such a kind of strong uh, and really challenging situation inside the broadcaster. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jamie. And hi, everyone. Um, actually, it's going to be exactly one year tomorrow since we journalists from um, Television Slovenia, mainly the news department, um, had first press conference um, where we openly exposed the problems we are facing um, uh, at our work at uh, Television Slovenia. Um, and uh, at that time, actually, uh, there, there has already been a sort of few months of intense pressure on editorial journalistic standards. Um, I have to tell you that in the beginning, journalists, we were not, we, maybe we had missed uh, some very important points. Um, it's not that we were not concerned, but the pressures, all kinds of pressures on our public broadcaster uh, have been with us for many, many years, for let's say 20, 25 years. Um, and maybe um, it, we were a little bit late recognizing that this time it actually goes for real. It goes for re really real. I can't um, um, point out enough uh, how serious our situation is and was already at the time. Um, actually, um, International Press Institute once created the model uh, of how uh, media capture 
happens in, um, in public media. And Jamie, you have used really good expression of uh, public media being the lowest fruit and the easiest to pick up. And actually everything that you wrote in that model um, happened to us. Um, in the first year of Jana, Janez Jansha's government, this is the um, center-right populist um, party that was in power uh, up until uh, April this year, um, they have successfully managed to overtake all oversight bodies within um, our national broadcaster. Uh, that means that in a 29 member um, a television council, there was huge majority for the people um, who are not all directly involved with, uh, with, with his party, uh, but they were sympathizers of the party. Um, I don't want to lose a lot of time with the uh, RTV law that was uh, that has been existed since uh, 2005, and this law actually uh, created the situation that enabled this um, um, this media capture. Um, after all the oversight bodies were taken, it was of course easy to appoint the general manager of National Broadcaster, who was who was not actually even very very political person, but um, but very quickly fell into the trap of, of this political trap and started the reforms that were very damaging for, uh, for RTV Slovenia. Uh, after him, um, there was a, a television director who was appointed. And the television director, you might all remember, we had this big uh, standoff of Slovenian press agency with the government that was happening uh, about a year ago. Uh, the, uh, the Slovenian press agency, which was established with our independence, basically lost all the uh, financing from the government. It was big story, people from European Union, from European Parliament Commission, were visiting Slovenia and warning every, everyone basically, um, you know, that there is a huge breach, uh, that it is, of course, terribly wrong what is happening to them. Now, this main guy who was leading campaign against the press agency was nominated as a director of television. So, of course, I mean, uh, after that, um, or even um, even before that, the editor in chief was named after the previous one professional um, editor in chief was sacked. So, I mean, suddenly all main positions within, within television Slovenia were taken by uh, by people who were um, affiliated with with the party, Janez Janša party, or or were sympathizers of the party, or have been working for Janez Janša in the past. Now, the latest uh, the latest person that joined us was uh, the head of the news department, who was also close associated with Janez Janša. She's actually called the media operative of Janez Janša. So imagine how, of course, the journalist situation developed in that uh, really. Um, situation. As I was saying, a year ago, we first warned that the, what is happening now is totally serious. Um, uh, we felt obliged uh, also by our code of conduct to uh, openly say that um, uh, our editorial and journalistic standards are being breached. Um, of course, no one listened to us. There were many, many standoffs in this year uh, with our general management, with the director of the television, with editor-in-chief. We had cases of censorship. Uh, we had all actually the worst examples uh, of um, media capture. Basically, you know, when suddenly really strange and dubious news items suddenly appear in the news, when all the uh, well-known um, uh, professional um, faces, uh, presenters, hosts, moderators, um, um, started to disappear from the screens, uh, um, also, the new management brought a lot of people, journalists from uh, the party-affiliated media. Um, some of, of, um, of those media outlets also being financed by, uh, by the uh, sources close to Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government. Um, and, uh, uh, but the thing that really hurt us um, I mean, the most 
was the fact that uh, some of the programs that were actually trademarks of Slovenia television, like even foreign affairs program, the Globe, like Studio, Studio City program, which was widely appreciated in Slovenian public. I mean, all that was canceled. This, about five, six really important TV shows um, have some, uh, suddenly disappeared and replaced by um, by new uh, news program um, that was supposed to attract wider audiences, which means um, it was, this new program was similar to a sort of so-called yellow press. I mean, um, and basically um, the, the most harmful thing that happened was that if you compare May last year with May this year, um, our ratings fell in news department for 25%. I mean, uh, which, I mean, can you imagine for every, um, uh, every media management uh, and also for journalists, this is, um, this is really terrible news. You know how, how hard it is in uh, such, a, such competitive circumstances to, to lose such audience and the fear of how will you get this audience back? But people start turning away from us because basically they um, they realize we are not credible source anymore, and um, this is a huge damage. Which uh, I'm personally not sure how this is going to be overcome in um, in next next years or in next decade. Um, the good point about uh, this whole uh, really bleak development was uh, that among the journalists, uh, even people who did not really take care so much about uh, journalistic autonomy, uh, because we presumed it as something normal. I mean, it has never been breached, uh, you know, up to such extent as this time. And if it was breached before, uh, there was a huge hassle was made about it. So uh, now we are so totally aware how uh, precious um, this basically value is. And we are also very much aware how easy it is to lose this uh, media uh, 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 journalistic autonomy and journalist freedom in a way that um, uh, connected us. And uh, sort of, we started, of course, about a year ago, a quite serious rebellion against the general management. Um, in well, first, we started with warnings, uh, first internally, then public warnings that what is happening is absolutely wrong. Um, in the beginning, in um, in April, we started. Um, um, we went on strike, but of course, being responsible journalists, we did not just want to shut down the programs. Um, we were striking. The first strike was in the way that we were explaining the importance of public service media for democratic society, of showing people what RTV is actually doing, that it's not only news. We were explaining our work. And I think this is one of the important elements that happened in that past year. Um, apart from that, we, we, we were basically creating uproar. We, we organized public debates, we organized uh, meetings in the center of Ljubljana. Uh, I think we started to create a really important bond with the public, something that uh, no one has actually done in the past 30 years because um, general management, our leadership never actually considered this to be so very important. Now we know only one thing, since even the new government did not manage to establish a sort of um, um, a sort of professional autonomy, journalistic autonomy, uh, we realized that our only ally is actually the public, and big part of public is actually supporting us in this uh, pre pre referendum campaign. Um, we are not actually uh, uh, agitating for. Um, for um, for the yes vote, but we tend to uh, remain fair and professional. We uh, answer questions about our situation at the news department, and we explain uh, and talk about the importance of public service media. And basically, the whole year, the whole year has been um, 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 has been going around only one thing: the fight for independence of our profession. Okay, thanks so much for setting the scene there. Um, obviously, sounds like an incredibly challenging situation and quite a hence atmosphere inside. It's not every day you get to vote in a referendum on reform of public broadcasting, and that's a really, really important issue. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but 
First, I want to come to you, Jan. We heard in, in Slovenia there, one of the key avenues for pressure on independent public service media comes through appointments to the oversight councils in programming supervisory boards. I imagine when Katsilia was, was talking, you heard a lot of similarities from the situation in the Czech Republic in previous years. Um, so if you could just walk us through what happened there um, and any similarities you saw, obviously the situation is not quite as severe as it is in Slovenia, um, but I think there's a lot of similar methods and tactics used. Uh, so if you could talk us through those, thanks. Yes, hello from Prague once again, and uh, absolutely. I've been thinking and I've been listening very carefully to what Xenia has been saying, and uh, you're absolutely right. There are some similarities. However, there are many differences too. First of all, I would say that uh, the current picture is not quite as bleak in the Czech Republic. The public media are alive and kicking. Uh, even if I may talk about my personal experience, I do a long, hard talk interview dealing with the politics mostly, and I have never felt any censorship or any even pressure. Uh, nobody tells me who to invite, who not to invite, what questions to ask, what questions not to ask. Uh, it's not only my program, pro program, obviously. I can see that many of my colleagues in the radio or in the Czech television manage to do high quality, hardcore journalism. But yes, we are worried that it may not last uh, forever and it may not even last for much longer. I must introduce very, very briefly the Czech media landscape because there are actually three public media uh, outlets. It's the Czech television, the Czech radio, and the Czech press agency. And it should be noted that the Czech TV and the Czech radio are separate institutions. It's uh, not one corporation like the BBC, for example. And uh, we, can, we can leave out the, the press agency because it's a slightly different story, but both the telly and the radio are financed by a license fee, or we call it concession fee, which is 135 crowns for the TV and 45 Czech crowns for the radio, which is roughly something like one and a half euro per month for uh, the, the radio service. Yeah? Uh, so you, you can see that it's really not much. And uh, yes, I'm coming here now to the question of uh, the governing bodies or we call them councils because all these three public media outlets have their own council. The council is supposed to oversee if they are fulfilling the task. Uh, they also deal with complaints from the listeners or, or, or viewers. And their main competence or their main, main weapon, some might say, is that they elect the director general. Members of these councils are chosen by the lower house of the parliament. And we've seen in the last decades that politicians have repeatedly tried to increase their influence in the councils. Last year in spring, uh, which was the time when uh, the prime minister was Andrei Babish, it seemed that the days of the director general of the Czech television were nearing uh, their end. And it also must be said that there has always been more pressure on the television than on the radio. Uh, politicians probably consider it more important. And what was happening with these councils was that we saw very, let's say unusual candidates elected as members of the councils. In some cases, they were people who were openly declaring hostility towards the public media, which was a completely paradox situation, but it was happening, yes. Uh, and what happened in the, in the spring when uh, there, there was uh, uh, this, uh, I, 
I wouldn't call it crisis really, but yes, the pressure was mounting. Uh, parties which were in opposition at that time joined forces to block electing other controversial candidates to the councils. Uh, then this situation changed and calmed down after the uh, parliamentary elections last autumn, because the opposition became the government. Uh, nevertheless, problems are, in my opinion, very far from being over. Uh, there are still some politicians uh, that still have a very negative uh, meaning about public media as such, and for various reasons. Uh, some of them take it personally because they feel that uh, these media are too critical about them. Uh, some take it ideologically because they believe that uh, there should be no public media, because th th there should be only private media uh, in, in their uh, ideology in their mind. Uh, so things at the moment are in the state of flux. There is some new legislation uh, being processed in the parliament at the moment, but I suppose we'll talk about that later on. So I would conclude here the opening speech uh, by saying that uh, the most pressing issue at the moment for us is the money. Current uh, license or concession fee really cannot cover uh, the needs. And uh, so far, we have not seen any, any proposal which would uh, solve this problem. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, I think the, the issue of license fees and funding for public media is something we'll, we'll chat about at the end as well. Um, again, thanks for setting the scene there. Um, Ksenia, on Sunday, citizens in Slovenia will go to the polls to vote on this referendum, a series of, uh, of different votes on local elections, presidential, other referendums as well. What will they be voting on in, uh, in that referendum? And what would the changes brought forward initiated in this bill by the the government which is being challenged in the referendum involve what would change at radio television slovenia up oh, you're, you're muted sorry <laughs> um on sunday people will vote on the legislation changes introduced by the new robert golob government uh, i have to remind you the robert golob uh, government was elected also on the promise that they will stop politicizing slovenian public media and they will resolve the question of political pressures on rtv um, immediately after they took power, they proposed this new legislation that was drawn by uh, members of, uh, of sort of legislative body, but also uh, by the help of civil society, mainly law experts that have been dealing with media law before. Uh, now, this is not um, um, sort of, you know, um, the huge law that will change uh, the way uh, RTV functions and works, because we, we'll, we still need modern, uh, good legislation that will take us to, I don't know, next century or at least next 50 years. Uh, these changes are actually very modest and mainly deal with um, uh, with attempt to depoliticize the RTV media service. So there are some structural changes. For instance, we will not have the general manager any longer, but there will be a different concept of leadership, um, which for us journalists is actually not very important. The main important importance um, for us is the change how the uh, oversight body members are being elected. Because according to the old legislation uh, um, from 2005, uh, that opened up um, uh, the, uh, the oversight body to, uh, to politics, 
totally. And of course, um, all the uh, members of uh, academy and people, media experts were warning at the time about what is going to happen. Now, the thing is, it did not happen immediately. It uh, happened step by step. And now we are actually in this last phase of, you know, of all the horrible things that this le legislation brought us. So now, um, According to new legislation, the member of oversight bodies are not going to be um, um, elected uh, by the members of parliament any longer. They will be appointed directly by different um, civil society uh, institutions and institutions like Academy of Art, like uh, human, uh, the guardian of human rights, like um, the sports organization, like uh, Olympic committee and, and other different um, sort of long established institutions um, that, um, that work within Slovenia. Up until now, um, every single uh, sort of um, civil society movement could actually propose uh, its candidate to the parliament, uh, which which opened um, which opened the way for little obscure party affiliated uh, groups to suggest the candidates. And when the previous government had a huge majority in the parliament, all these candidates sort of very easily ended up in the um, in the TV council. Uh, these were not candidates that ever uh, sort of dealt with the media before. They were not experts in in any way. And I know this is not the preconditions for having a good oversight bodies, but these people, uh, these peoples, most of them only credential was affiliation with the party or um, basically they sympathize with the party. So this for us is actually the most important thing. What is, what is going to happen with this new legislation? We don't know yet. Um, the well, what will happen on Sunday? It's absolutely not clear yet. We are hoping for best results. Uh, as I was saying, journalists were um, sort of um, um, we we did everything we could to explain our situation. We were also helped by some recent developments that worked in uh, in in our favor. For instance, the program at RTV Slovenia <laughs> is at the moment um, so um, so biased that actually the audience is complaining all the time and on daily basis. I mentioned how the ratings fell. Other important factor was the fact that um, that the general manager issued 38 uh, final warnings uh, to us journalists who were like support who supported the uh, TV presenter and the editor of specific program, uh, where they um, basically um, warned the public that the program is prepared under strict uh, direction by um, editor in chief. And uh, that actually also, um, it raised awareness among people that something is happening at RTV Slovenia and people sort of started reading the news maybe more attentively when they realized something really um, um, big is going on. And um, basically in the last week, many civil society movements organized, um, you know, big demonstrations in our favor. Uh, so um, as I mentioned before, and I don't want to repeat myself, um, the importance is that basically awareness of what um, public media service should do is raised at the moment. And if, if sort of, um, if, if this legislation is put through, of course, then there is this uh, huge energy within RTV and in the public that um, things should be improved and put on new basis. Okay, thanks. Um, turning to, to the Czech Republic now, uh, obviously we've heard that from Slovenia, uh, one initiative, this would sort of blend the two um, councils together and uh, the key thing would be election who, who appoints those members it wouldn't be the national assembly or the parliament civil society uh, in the Czech Republic we see the same root cause that's trying to be addressed this over politicization of the bodies uh, but there the government has a different uh, a different model for for addressing this so if you could explain how that uh, reform initiative looks uh, in the Czech Republic Jan. First of all, I must say that uh, we've been seeing something very, very similar in terms that uh, any group, any club, 
uh, and its society could uh, nominate their own member of the council. Uh, it could have been a gardening club from the tiniest village. Uh, and uh, this, on one hand, this uh, seemed very democratic. On the other hand, it resulted in uh, those like, rather unusual candidates being elected as members of uh, the councils. So what's happening now? The new government, which uh, won the elections last autumn, have in their manifesto three points concerning media. Number one is that they will focus on sustainable financing of the public media. Second is that members of the councils will be chosen, um, chosen also by the upper house of the parliament, not only by the lower chamber as until today. And third, that they will promote a transparency in uh, cash flows by allowing the Supreme Control Office to audit the public media. Well, the, the, the third point, nobody says no. Why, why not? Of course, it, 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 there should be transparency in financing. But uh, what has happened uh, so far is that the government started from the middle, really. <laughs> they started with uh, the process of electing the members of uh, the councils. Uh, the, the debate is still going on. Um, the opposition is very, very strongly against uh, this change that it should be also the Senate, the, the upper house of uh, the parliament involved in the process. Uh, it uh, has not been decided yet. We still don't know the details, but it seems also given the fact that the government uh, have a very comfortable majority in, in the parliament, that it's very, very likely that uh, this will be passed, the, uh, the, the, this, this change. Nevertheless, uh, there are still questions to be answered, uh, for example, about the qualification of uh, the candidates eligible to uh, the council. So we have to wait uh, still, there, there has not been uh, the decision taken, but there has been already some disappointment here because obviously the government started with uh, something uh, uh, least difficult <laughs> and probably uh, not the most important. Uh, so, yes, generally, I think we as journalists believe that uh, it is a movement in the right direction, but it's a rather small one and we still need uh, some, some details. And if I may add just one more thing, uh, politicians obviously don't live completely detached from the rest of the society. And when Xenia was talking about the awareness of the public, about how important public media are, uh, then I must say that uh, there has been a lot, a lot of hate speech against public media on the net and on the squares. There have been quite uh, numerous uh, demonstrations in the Czech Republic this autumn. And uh, quite often media, especially the Czech television, was attacked in a very aggressive and very vulgar uh, way. So there is one part of society, and please don't ask me how large this part of society is, which is really extremely hostile towards the public media. And uh, I'm sure that the politicians hear the noise of the streets.
Thanks, Jan. Radka, I want to bring you in in a second, but there's just one, one key similarity as well between these two initiatives in, in Slovenia and the Czech Republic that I wanted to look at. Uh, Jan, when, when the Ministry of Culture in the Czech Republic was developing its initial bill, I think there was a, there was a plan at the beginning um, to, uh, yeah, to, to implement changes that would uh, see the appointment of a brand new uh, council. That was uh, the government consulted its lawyers, and there was concerns about whether that would uh, be constitutional. And in the end, they had to change it to instead expand the number of councillors on the board, um, and then obviously split it between both houses of parliament. Uh, Senia, I think we've seen that uh, the opposition party, which initiated the referendum in Slovenia, have said that if they they lose that referendum, they will take the case to the constitutional court. Um, so there are constitutional issues here. Uh, I wonder, yeah, if the, how the assessment is of of, of whether, uh, you know, if there have been legal experts commenting on that in, in Slovenia about how likely it is it would pass at the constitutional court. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jamie. Just allow me to first briefly comment on what Jan said, because I wouldn't like to leave the impression that uh, in Slovenia, uh, all the public is uh, totally in love with FTV Slovenia. Of course not. We have, um, like in Czech Republic, there is a large chunk of Slovenian society that absolutely hates everything coming from RTV Slovenia. They criticize us absolutely where, everywhere possible. Um, the former party uh, is, of course, one important source of this resentment, and then the people affiliated with them, I mean, they will still leave helpful comments on Twitter, Facebook, and the rest. So um, I'm not saying the situation is perfect at all, a uh, large chunk, but um, as um, um, I think Klaus Unterberger from ORF once said, uh, you can never win them all. There is a big part of society who will never be convinced that public service media uh, uh, is, is very important. I, I guess in this sense, we have both illnesses. We have this Eastern European um, um, you know, tr transitional syndrome that, um, impacts uh, many of Eastern European public service media. And then of course, uh, something what is happening to the B BBC, basically the financial pr pressures of the competition, uh, basically the, the mixture of it, of it both. Um, but I have to say, okay, now if, uh, let's say, if, uh, if we win this yes vote, which we journalists believe it would be good for our independence, because it's not um, only that the previous government party uh, will have problems um, getting back in RTV in most important seats. Also, the new government sort of um, um, limits itself, you know, grasping for most important seats. And especially since uh, the new government did not actually take any, you know, you can always do uh, measures that are a, a little bit nasty or let's say unclean, replacing some people and so on. This government didn't do any of them. We journalists were sometimes, you know, when we were really in desperate situations, we were even angry with them. Can't you just do something? But they didn't do anything, um, partly due to, um, you know, also incompetence of the uh, government formed by totally new party that came to power, and partly because they don't want to repeat the same mistakes done by their predecessors. So basically, now we are in perfect condition, perfect position, when we don't owe anything, anyone, if you know what I mean, not even previous government, of course, and not even to the current government. We have no debts now, apart from, as I mentioned before, the society and civil society. Okay, coming back to your question, what um, the, the current opposition did, of course, they announced already in the summer that uh, they will take the issue to the constitutional court. And uh, what can happen there? Um, if they, and they will have to, of course, debate the issue. This is not something that worries us. The problematic from our point of view would be if they would uh, stop the law coming into the power immediately, because it would mean that current situation at the RTV will be dragged indefinitely. And not only dragged indefinitely the current position, because uh, there are many parts of RTV that were not yet conquered. What is conquered at the moment is uh, RTV Slovenia news department, but their influence is spreading. You know, the leadership, of course, has have. 
I mean, radio, as Ian mentioned earlier, radio is left alone a little bit, but you can already see the signs that they're not happy with the leadership. But first, they just wanted to have television. Radio is the next step. Online has already been sort of subdued. Um, so what the legal experts are saying, again, well, it depends whom you are asking. If you ask the experts that are leaning towards the former uh, populist uh, center-right government, they will say, oh, it's absolutely unconstitutional. Uncon you can never end the mandate of the people who are sitting in oversight bodies just like that. Um, um, it is, they claim it's unconstitution unconstitutional, even more bizarre, bizarre aspect. Um, other part uh, of the um, of the of the experts are uh, convinced that this would that this legislation can never be a breach of Slovenian constitution. Now, you know who's telling the truth. It, we will see what will happen at the constitutional court. Of course, we are hoping that a constitutional court can end our um, struggle, but you never know. But in any case. Uh, we have a referendum on Sunday, and then it, it takes ages, of course, before all the, all the um, election results are counted. And then, of course, uh, it is only at that time when all the procedures can take place. So in a way, uh, we cannot expect changes at RTV Slovenia uh, before, let's say, March, April, or some more realistic and maybe less involved people that I am uh, will say it can take even much longer. Okay, yeah, key, key message there that even if this referendum is, is won, the problems are far from over and it's, it's one step forward. Uh, Radka, I, I wanna bring you in here because we've heard two, you know, two, two different uh, models here, very similar challenges. How similar are, are these, these pressures to, to facing uh, in these two countries for, for public media across Europe as well. Uh, if you could give us a kind of regional perspective on that. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, first, uh, please allow me to, to comment on uh, Jan and uh, Xenia mentioned, um, mentioned regarding the, um, the, the different uh, attitudes and, uh, and uh, towards uh, public service media, because uh, indeed uh, we have, uh, we are coming from uh, Difficult times of COVID. We have war, uh, political turms, uh, turmoils in uh, uh, in Europe, and uh, uh, societies are completely divided. Uh, but, um, however, our recent EBU uh, survey uh, showing trust in media shows that uh, in 28 out of 31 countries, uh, the PSM news, public service media news, are most trusted, and. Uh, I mean, uh, talking about Czech, uh, 60 percent, 68 percent of the of the Czechs, uh, Czech people uh, trust uh, Czech television, and 74 percent of Estonians, for instance, uh, trust their public service media. Uh, so I I think that uh, despite of the the challenges, despite of the uh, difficulties, public service media are really showing uh, big relevance, and, uh, and people need public service media in uh, in difficult times. Uh, uh, I am coming now to, to answer to your question. I'll be talking about Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, I think that we will all agree that the major challenges are independence, uh, public service media um, governance, and service media funding. Uh, we have to, to ensure strong safeguards uh, for public service media independence and institutional and editorial autonomy in the legal frameworks. The international standards are clear. We have uh, uh, public service media uh, um, uh, values, the uh, core values uh, uh, adopted by the EBU General Assembly, and these are universality, diversity, independence, accountability, innovation, and, and excellence. Uh, we have the Council of Europe standards on uh, independence of public service media 9610 uh, recommendation 20 uh, to 2012 uh, one on uh, public service media governance the the standards are clear we have uh, most of the central in eastern european countries we have uh, good laws uh, uh, generally in line with uh, council of europe recommendations but the implementation is really a challenge in in, in some countries we we even have a uh, non-compliance with the with the national law and not uh, uh, implementing uh, national uh, national legal provisions. Uh, 
so I think that um, also uh, we we have to ensure that uh, there is the depoliticization of, of uh, governance and uh, influence uh, political influence on public service media and that we, we need a governing bodies of public service media which are composed of media experts and not uh, delegates without uh, knowledge of uh, the problematic. Um, uh, for example, in, uh, in some of the Central and Eastern European countries, uh, for instance, in Romania, uh, the, the parliament uh, can uh, dismiss uh, uh, president and uh, director general of, uh, of the public service media if uh, they uh, do not um, um, adopt the annual reports, uh, which opens door for uh, undue political in interference. Uh, the director general of uh, in Croatian public service media uh, is uh, directly um, uh, elected by the parliament. Uh, so uh, most of the uh, most of the supervisory councils in uh, in public service media in Central and Eastern Europe are elected by simple majority of parliaments, which represents the ruling majority basically and uh, does not ensure broader political consensus. Uh, in Kosovo, for instance, the council, the supervisory body reports every four months uh, to the parliament, which exposes it to uh, undue political interference. Um, however, we have also good examples. Uh, for instance, uh, I, would, I would say that uh, uh, Georgia uh, has ensured uh, constitutional guarantee for independence of uh, public service media. There is an article uh, providing for uh, independence of public service media in the constitution, which also uh, provides a, a, a remedy on, a, on the highest possible constitutional level. Uh, it is also positive that uh, uh, we, we want to implement the, the, the national legislation better, but if we look at the laws and the legal frameworks in Central and Eastern Europe, you will see that most of the uh, supervisory councils are uh, depoliticized. Uh, you cannot find uh, political functionaries or holder, holders of uh, political functions uh, uh, being elected as, as council members. Uh, they even in some in some uh, uh, um, legal frameworks. Uh, there is a provision for a chilling period. So if someone has hold political functions or have been um, hold a, a, a political function, uh, it, it should be uh, three years before he would be uh, eligible to uh, apply for uh, for a member of, of a council. So these are these are um, positive uh, examples. Uh, also, I would say um, that uh, um, uh, the mobilization, so to say, of, of the civil society and also international organizations uh, uh, um, change, uh, change the course of action in, in a positive direction. For instance, I, I'm sure that all of us would remember what happened in Poland in 2015 when, uh, when the Ministry of Treasury, Treasury wanted to appoint the Supervisory Council and the, um, uh, and the presidents of uh, uh, TVP and uh, Polish radio. And uh, the international pressure was really uh, very, very great. And uh, uh, this, uh, this caused uh, then uh, the creation of a national media council, which is now appointing the supervisory board and, uh, and the presidents of the TVP and uh, PR. Uh, and uh, for instance, in uh, North Macedonia, we, have, uh, uh, we had a very good provision of um, um, uh, election of uh, supervisory councils uh, by a qualified majority. However, the practice uh, showed that they, they cannot reach uh, this, uh, this majority, which is a pity because now they are, uh, they are considering if they should reverse uh, the legislation to, to all the uh, simple majority. Um, recently, there are many, many uh, countries considering uh, revising and, uh, and improving the legal frameworks, like for instance in Montenegro, they, they consider strengthening the professional criteria for, uh, for council members, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is a good, a good effort uh, and uh, uh, is the, which it uh, should be acknowledged. Uh, for in Serbia, for instance, uh, they have uh, created an additional buffer uh, from, from, the, uh, from the politics. So the, the supervisory council is not elected in the parliament, but is elected uh, by the uh, regulatory authority, REM, uh, which, which makes a bigger distance from, uh, directly from, uh, from politics. Uh, of course, now the challenge is to, to ensure that this regulatory body is uh, independent. Um, and then um, I would mention also uh, another 
uh, more Eastern example from uh, from the Baltics, uh, where um, there was um, not clear separation between the regulatory authority and the supervisory council. Uh, and now this uh, this is also uh, changed in the uh, in the recent uh, changes in the law, which is uh, also a good uh, good example of uh, uh, good implementation of the Council of Europe recommendations for clear separation of supervisory and management powers. And of course, funding. Uh, I think it it is uh, it is really a challenge. Uh, license fee is a good model, ensuring direct contact with the audience um, in the Central and Eastern uh, European region, uh, uh, Czech, Slovenia, Slovakia, Croatia, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia are funded through a license fee. Uh, however, in many of them, the license fee haven't been um, adjusted for years, uh, and it's, it's uh, on a very, very low uh, level. And we have here to, to, to acknowledge and to say that uh, according to our EBU recent research on uh, a license fee, um, the, the, the fee cost uh, 0 0.28 uh, cents per day per household on average. And this is only 0.4% of the GDP per capita on, on average. And for these uh, public service media produce programs for children, for uh, uh, disabilities for minorities, for I mean, uh, name what not, uh, and it 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 is uh, it is an institution which uh, which uh, is needed, especially now when we see such a division in society. It's an institution which which caters for social cohesion and for tolerance and understanding, and, and it's it is uh, uh, by far uh, needed, especially now in, in this uh, democratic decline which we are uh, witnessing. Um, I would say one more thing on, on the license fee. We have seen uh, recently countries which uh, which um, uh, scrapped the license fee. North Macedonia, Romania, for instance, they went to uh, uh, to allocation from the budget, and then since since then they are they are, they are in a constant struggle and, and uh, uh, constant decline of their uh, their budget. So I I think that uh, we should really. Uh, encourage uh, um, encourage states uh, to uh, to take seriously and to take public service media not as uh, an expense but as an investment in uh, in democracy and uh, it is uh, indeed needed that uh, public service media is uh, stably uh, independently and adequately uh, funded. I would stop here because I see that we are sure, running yeah. out of time. But I'll be more than glad to share even more more examples and more experiences from Central and Eastern Europe. Bottom line is really public service media is needed, but we need really uh, loved and watched by vast majority public service media. Thank you. Thanks, Radka. And I forgot to mention that Ksenia had to had to jump off, but I'm sure we'll all be watching uh, for the result of the referendum on on Sunday. Um, one more question for you then, Radka. Uh, if, if the audience have questions, please put them into the, the Q&A. Um, we had a comment earlier from, from Joseph Borg from, from Malta. Um, obviously, independence of public service media there is, is really, really questionable, uh, really challenging situations in Poland, in Hungary, obviously, where capture of media is, is near complete. Uh, you mentioned kind of legal frameworks and what are the key initiatives um, from the European Union is the, the upcoming Media Freedom Act, uh, which is their kind of major initiative to try and defend and safeguard independent journalism across the EU. This has specific rules on the governance and independence of public service media. So in these countries like Malta, like Hungary, like Poland and Czech Republic and Slovenia, how, in your view, um, can the, the, the Media Freedom Act help with this situation? I uh, thank you, Jamie, for this question, and I think this is that this is a fantastic initiative, and uh, we, uh, I mean, it should be boldly and strongly supported because this would give definitely uh, a big instrument, especially in the fragile democracies or in uh, countries where uh, where public service media needs really a uh, bigger bigger support. Uh, it if for first time we we have such a, an instrument which. Uh, provides additional safeguards for independence of public service media for adequate and independent funding. And I think uh, here we, uh, of course, I mean, we could debate now about uh, some eventually some improvements and uh, some things which could be uh, improved. But I think that now we need really solidarity among uh, uh, 
uh, European members uh, to, to, to support it and to, to see it as a, as a tool to uh, really help uh, members where, uh, where there is still a, a very big struggle for independence of public service media. Okay, thanks. If, if we don't have any other questions in the chat, Jan, I'd, I'd like to ask one more uh, for yourself. Uh, I think it was it a couple of weeks ago where uh, this this reform initiative was passed in the lower house in the in the Czech Republic, um, and now it's I understand going to the to the Senate. Um, what? Oh, okay. I think we we might have lost him. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah they, 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 they voted on that. It's gone to the Senate now, and I was going to ask when it's going to come back um, for a full vote. Uh, I understand that the government wanted to get this passed before Christmas. Um, we'll see what that's looking like. And again, in Slovenia, we have a Sunday. So it's been a long way to get to these two points, but um, edging closer to potential change. Radka, um, I was going to ask Jan about the funding situation, because even if both of these initiatives are passed, uh, both broadcasters remain in a really challenging financial situation. Um, but in the current climate, economically, increases in license fees, um, you know, are, are not a particularly hot topic and governments appear unlikely to, to go down this path. So, uh, yeah, I mean, at the European perspective and level as well, you know, what are some of the, the best models for, for funding of, of public media? Um, and is this a challenge that we see across the board? Yeah, I, I mean, there are really different uh, models, Jamie, uh, a good model now, which even the Nordics and uh, uh, Lithuania is uh, a tax, uh, a certain tax, and then it it uh, uh, it allows for for independent funding, but it allows also for predictable and, and stable funding, yeah, because it's, as I mentioned, public service media uh, has to provide uh, different programs for different for all segments of society. Uh, so, for instance, the acquisitions for big sporting events or for big shows or for big uh, domestic drama has to be done long in advance. Uh, and and uh, stability and uh, like pre predictability of, uh, uh, of funding is uh, very important. So I would say uh, tax is, uh, is a good uh, model. Uh, then we see, for instance, in Georgia, there is a uh, Fixed percentage from the gross domestic product uh, from uh, from GDP, which also uh, provides uh, uh, certain guarantees and certain sa safeguards for uh, independent of, uh, of public service media funding. Uh, and I have to to say here that uh, uh, all our public service broadcasters are uh, to a different uh, to a different degree, of course, but are engaging in digital transformation. And, and are trying to uh, maximize and optimize their their structures, their costs, and uh, some of them are investing now in solar energy because they are they are very dependent on uh, on electricity, obviously, and, and on petrol because they are on the wheels. Uh, their reporting uh, is on the wheel. Uh, so uh, there there are many uh, positive initiatives which which are really looking into into efficiencies into. Uh, uh, into making possible uh, to uh, to produce more uh, more programs with with less. I mean, I I, I would uh, give even a Czech television as, as a fantastic example because they they have not only um, uh, sold some of the the, the food, football rights that they are uh, they're considering also shrinking some of, of the of the channel, some of the programs, but still they want to uh, to preserve the highest possible quality so that they do not uh, diminish this trust, which I mentioned, sixty eight percent of the of the audience uh, uh, trusting in uh, in Czech television. So uh, they are they they are very big initiative, big scale initiatives which Director General uh, now is undertaking to uh, to ensure that. Uh, that they are they are mostly efficient uh, and they could meet the, the challenges of the nowadays uh, economic difficulties. Okay, thanks, Radka. Uh, we had one question from Christoph, but we said we would keep it to 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 one hour, so I think we'll have to wrap up there. Uh, I may respond to you, uh, yeah, uh, outside the webinar, Christoph. But um, yeah, I think these are two really really interesting case studies. Um, and while it's not clear how they will go in the Czech Republic and Slovenia. I think we see them both as principal democratic attempts to, to ensure the, the independence of these broadcasters, not just now, not just for these governments, but for all future governments. So I'm sure we'll be watching closely on Sunday. Really interested to see how that goes. 
Um, we, we shared through the webinar a number of uh, links to statements. Um, earlier today, the, the MFRR and other media freedom organizations published our position statement on the, the reform in Slovenia. I really encourage you to look at that, to share, to report. Um, so thanks, thanks a lot for your, your insight, Radka, to Jan and Ksenia as well, uh, and for everyone watching. Um, thanks a lot for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again on another episode of uh, or another webinar of the MFRR in focus. Many thanks.